order, brethren, to receive the most worshipful, the Grand Master. as equals and we have an opportunity to create a nation in the very essence of Masonic morality. It would be wonderfully symbolic, don't you think? You'll be wanting to put the all-seeing eye on our banknotes next. Uh, uh, you, uh, you think I'm taking it a bit far? Please don't ask me questions like that, Brother Franklin. You know I cannot tell a lie. <laughs> Oh, come on, Brother Washington. Everybody lies occasionally, surely. Especially politicians. Not me. Not even so much as an alternative fact. Oh, but we must all be aware of fake news. <laughs> the people must be free to think what they like as well. We can have no thought police in our new society. The foundation stone of our new nation built on all those principles that we hold dear. The plans for our new capital city already have a very Masonic feel to them. Yeah. Candidate for initiation into the order, I'm giving them a little introduction into some of our mysteries. These two gentlemen are founding an entire nation built on our principles. There we have great promises for our new nation. You know, I wonder if other presidents after me will also be Freemasons. Many will be. And Freemasonry will become embedded in the American culture. And the eye will appear on the banknotes. Oh, God. These principles will be honored with a gift from your French brethren. A gift that will be a welcoming beacon to the poor and oppressed. This is the statue we are giving you. It's a bit small, isn't it? Oh, this is a maquette. The real thing is bigger. Much, much bigger. America will produce a great many great Americans from many different walks of life and many different fields, and many will be Masons. Sportsmen! Actors! Writers! Soldiers! Filmmakers, businessmen, inventors, astronauts. Uh, what on earth is an astronaut? No, they're not. I don't follow. Well, they're not on Earth, they're in space. In fact, Brother Buzz Aldrin was the second man to walk upon the surface of the moon. Uh, that's the best thing I've heard this evening. What, that a mason walked on the moon? Man on the moon. Amazing. But don't forget the musicians. Do not forget the musicians. Authoritarian and totalitarian regimes continue to suppress Freemasonry, afraid of its strong heritage of liberty and equality. It symbolizes the inevitability of your end. The British Army had traveling lodges that moved with regiments. Freemasons have served their countries and communities with distinction. Freemasons met across the Union and Confederate divide to celebrate their common rituals. And today, Freemasonry remains an active part of military life in many countries. Freemasonry has burned as a blazing fire through the last three centuries, the driving force behind the Royal Society, 
was initiated into Freemasonry. Prince Edward, Duke of Kent, father of Queen Victoria, and Prince Augustus, Duke of Sussex. The two princes brought their feuding Grand Lodges together and reconciled to be the United Grand Lodge of England. Kings George IV, William IV, Edward VII, Edward VIII, and George VI were all Freemasons, as were 18 dukes and princes, including the Duke of Edinburgh. This year, His Royal Highness Prince Edward, the Duke of Kent, celebrates his 50th year as Grand Master of the United Grand Lodge of England. His Royal Highness was proposed into Freemasonry by the then Grand Master, the Earl of Scarborough. He was initiated into Royal Alpha Lodge No. 16, an advocate for the craft all over the world, continuing three centuries of distinguished royal tradition at the very heart of English Freemasonry. To order brethren to receive the most worshipful, the Grand Master. As permanent master of these three lodges, I now call on my deputy masters. Most worshipful Grand Master. Most worshipful Grand Master. Most worshipful Grand Master. Most worshipful Grand Master. I humbly ask you to complete the initiation of this worthy candidate for Freemasonry. Dawn our ceremonies and forever remind us of our incomparable heritage, the birth of organized Freemasonry, stressing the deep and sincere loyalty and affection felt by the Brethren of the United Grand Lodge of England for their Grand Master. I had the pleasure of meeting 136 Grand Masters visiting from overseas at Freemasons Hall yesterday. Today, though, we are a meeting of more than 4,000 gathered from all around the world, from our own constitution and beyond. When the global Masonic family comes together to celebrate our past, and renew our own pride and confidence in and enthusiasm for Freemasonry. I hereby read the text of a letter sent today to Buckingham Palace. May it please your majesty. We, the representatives of over 200,000 Freemasons under the United Grand Lodge of England, most respectfully express our continuing loyalty to your majesty's throne and person in this the 66th year of your long and distinguished reign of His Royal Highness the Duke of Kent as our much loved and greatly respected Grand Master. We humbly thank God for preserving our order and fervently pray his blessings on your Majesty so that our loyal devotion to your Majesty may long continue. Given at the Royal Albert Hall this 31st day of October, Anno Domini 2017. Her Majesty has been pleased to reply in the following terms. The Queen has asked me to thank you for your kind letter of loyal greetings on behalf of the representatives of the Freemasons under the United Grand Lodge of England, which are being celebrated on the 31st of October at the Royal Albert Hall. Her Majesty appreciated your thoughtfulness in writing as you did. We leave the Royal Albert Hall even more proud of our ancient institution. Worldwide, Freemasonry remains as important and relevant as ever. A global society of perhaps six million people. As the globe embraced Freemasonry, enlightenment came. I may not agree with what you say, but I shall defend to the death your right to say it. None is more hopelessly enslaved than those who falsely believe they are free coat of arms of Donald Trump, what does it actually represent? Well, this is rather interesting, actually. This is an uh, arcane Scottish heraldic law providing evidence of uh, uh, Donald Trump's uh, deep Anglophilia, I would say, and also touches upon the royal prerogative. Uh, there we have the double-headed eagle representing his uh, Scottish G Germanic uh, her heritage.
the actors were high masons. You take those early actors, Frank Sinatra, all of those that were involved in those movies, John Wayne, they were all 33 degree Freemasons. And if you follow it down through the line to this very day, most of the actors, I would say the great majority, if not all of the major actors, are all high masons. All the singers, all of them. They're all idols of Satan. That's what we have in Washington, D.C. They're beautiful. Oh, yes, they're beautiful. They're lovely. They're made of stone. But they are of the devil. There's a famous book published by Freemasonry in Washington, D.C. It's entitled 10,000 Famous Freemasons. That's the title of it. 10,000 Famous Freemasons. It's a great reference book. You'll find the names of astonishing people there. In fact, it seems that at least 14 U.S. presidents have been Freemasons. Some 35 Supreme Court judges have been Freemasons. And the numbers of governors and generals and senators and congressmen are innumerable. Laying the cornerstones of buildings which serve mankind is one of the world's most ancient customs. The cornerstones of the president's house known to us as the White House, the Washington Monument, the Smithsonian, Independence Hall in Philadelphia, incidentally by past Grand Master Benjamin Franklin, and Constitution Hall stand out among many others as outstanding examples of cornerstones which have been laid Masonically. The Washington Monument, that giant obelisk, is based on an obelisk from the 14th century BC, ancient Egypt. Now, why would we have an obelisk in Washington, DC? Look at the word itself, obelisk. Notice it has the word bell in it, obelisk. Look down at your Bible in Jeremiah chapter 50, and it says, declare ye among the nations and publish and set up a standard, publish and conceal not. Say, Babylon is taken, Baal is confounded. You see, Baal was their false god. Notice that the obelisk stands in the midst of a great circle. The obelisk is in fact the phallus symbol, the phallus symbol. It's the phallus of the great sun god, the great architect. He is the one who designs the world and it is his architecture that reigns. You will find an obelisk right before the Vatican in Rome. You will find one in London. You'll find also, of course, throughout Egypt, the obelisk. You, you, you'll even go to New York. You can go to Central Park, and you'll see the, the needle of Cleopatra, so-called. So the occult world has placed these obelisks in the major cities across this globe. But in Washington, D.C. is the primary obelisk. Know all of you who hear me. We proclaim ourselves free and lawful masons. We are met in open day under the broad canopy of heaven to lay the cornerstone of this building, symbol of freedom to our citizens. May the Lord prosper our handiwork, and may this building continue for centuries as a credit to the nation and a blessing to the citizens thereof. You know, Jefferson not only helped to design, along with Lafon, the capital of the United States, but Jefferson also helped to design the great seal of the United States. Take out your $1 bill, the most common currency of the United States. There you will see the hidden side of the great seal. And there you have a great pyramid, the Egyptian pyramid. And directly above the pyramid is an all-seeing eye and a, inside a triangle. That all-seeing eye is the eye of Horus, the son of the sun god. 
What is America doing with the sign of Osiris and his son Horus and their great pyramid? Now, there is a motto also uh, to the reverse side of the great seal. It's E Pluribus Unum. The motto of our nation, A Pluribus Unum, is in Latin, which is the language of the Roman Empire. And it says, out of many, one. And if you think about it, that's exactly what the New World Order is. It's many nations coming together into one nation. It's many religions coming together into one religion. It's many different currencies and financial systems all joining together into one. Out of many, one. A pluribus unum. And when we think about that motto, out of many, one, think about the New World Order. It's many nations becoming one. Out of many religions, one. Out of many financial currencies, one. People may also be thinking, well, does it really matter that these are on the back of an American dollar or any other currency for that matter? What is the significance? I wouldn't have known the answer to that question had I not had meetings in Seattle, Washington. One afternoon I was walking into a building and a girl came in carrying a large volume called The Secret Teachings of All Ages by Manley Hall, a top Freemason writer. And when I saw the book I got excited. I said, how much for your book, dear? She said, $20. So I paid her 20 American and I got the book. And I trust she bought another one. When I took that book home, I discovered much of the answers to my problems. Um, for example, he said there in that book that when America was settled, it was settled by two groups of people, the Pilgrim Fathers, and that's why we read here in God We Trust, they settled America for religious freedom. He said at the same time, a group of occultists and Freemasons settled it for a peculiar and a particular purpose known only to the initiated few. The initiated few are called in Freemasonry in the top degrees, the adepts, the elect and the sages. These men settled it for the main purpose of putting Lucifer, the god of Freemasonry, on the throne of the world. According to the Freemason world, they have a plan, an agenda. They believe that agenda will be worked out when finally the United States meets its destiny. What is to be the destiny of the United States? It's not democracy. It's not freedom. We are to be the Masonic capstone of this world. We are to represent the Freemasons. They will become the lords of earth. And we shall be a subservient people. This is the hidden agenda. This is the secret destiny of America. But it's been clothed in stone, uh, in the stone idols and statues and buildings and architecture of Washington, D.C. We see a wonderful historic day for the nation and the Freemasons of the United States of America are most privileged and happy to be able to participate in this momentous event. We are beginning our day as we do in Freemasonry uh, with the thought of God. In order to be a Freemason, one must not belong to any particular religion, but he must believe in a supreme being in some form. Senator Thurman, Members of Congress, most worshipful Grand Masters, my brother Masons, and my fellow Americans. Today is a most sacred and special occasion for all of us. 200 years ago, beneath this hallowed sanctuary, the Capitol cornerstone was laid by President and then Grand Master of Freemasons, George Washington. The inauguration of George Washington had taken place on April 30th of that year on the Bible which is here this morning through the courtesy of St. John's Lodge Number 1. This is the same Bible upon which Presidents Clinton, Bush, Carter, and George Washington 
were inaugurated president. The story of how uh, Washington, D.C. came to be is very interesting. Washington, D.C. was originally farmland. This was chosen, of course, by Jefferson and Washington and others to be the site of the new capital of the United States. But Thomas Jefferson uh, knew that this great city needed a full-time architect. He would be the one who watched over it, but he obtained the services of a man from France, a Freemason named Pierre Lafont. Pierre Lafont was a man who knew the Masonic occult world. He knew what he was designated to do. He uh, sought to build a, a, a city which was shaped in the form of a pentagram. The first time I heard that, you know what I did? I went on Google Earth, because I don't just believe everything I hear. I went on Google Earth. I didn't even look at a map. I looked at Google Earth and just zoomed in with a satellite image on that, uh, and I said, there it is. I mean, it's, you'd have to be blind not to see it. I was thinking like, okay, how am I gonna find it? And there was just, it's right there. You can't miss it. The United States of America has historically been a Christian nation in the sense that most of the people who live here have claimed the name of Jesus Christ. But when it comes to our government, when it comes to our leaders, it's a completely different story. They are not Christian at all. All you have to do is just walk around Washington, D.C. The city of Washington, D.C. is loaded with images and idols and obelisks, that, you know, satanic symbols and stuff like that. Of course, the whole world knows the name Washington, D.C. What does it mean? Well, of course, it's named after George Washington, the uh, general who defeated the uh, English in the American Revolution. Washington, D.C. But there's a D.C., a District of Columbia, after the name of Washington. What is the District of Columbia? You know, a lot of people have seen Columbia pictures. They see the, the logo when the woman comes out and, and the beautiful woman and she's holding a great flame in her hand or a great light, the great torch, the, the, the torch of knowledge of light because Satan comes as an angel of light. That's his light. She's his goddess and she's holding up that light. But why would the District of Columbus be called that? Why not the District of Christ? You know, yeah, it's, it's well, the there District you, of Columbia, there a you false go. goddess. There you go, a and false it's goddess. It's just a totally pagan place. A, a totally Everywhere pagan place. you turn is paganism. That's right. Then go to the individual state capitals and you'll find the same idolatry. I remember as a child touring the state capital in Sacramento, California and seeing the seal of the great state of California, which is Athena. And here's a statue of Athena. And here's another statue of Athena. And look at the capitals of the states themselves. In fact, even the symbol of our nation is a graven image because the Statue of Liberty is a graven image by anybody's definition. It is a carved image of man. Now you say, well, it's a woman. But here's the thing, it's a man that's dressed up as a woman. I'm not kidding. You think I'm kidding, but I'm not. See, Lady Liberty is actually patterned after the Greek god Prometheus. That god right there is the, the light bearer or Lucifer even. The one who brings the light, who is the one who supposedly among the gods brought down knowledge, right? How, like, sort of like the knowledge of good and evil, perhaps? Like, hey, eat of that tree and, and you'll be like gods. He, Prometheus, was the one who did that. And that is a replica of Prometheus. A bronze statue of Prometheus giving humanity knowledge at the Rockefeller Center. The eight-ton gilded cast bronze statue was sculpted by Paul Manship in 1934 and placed above the lower plaza at the Rockefeller Center. It represents the Greek titan Prometheus giving humanity fire, thus enabling civilization to progress. The sculpture stands before the inscription, Prometheus, teacher in every art, brought the fire that hath proved to mortals a means to mighty ends. The Rockefeller family is a prominent player in the New World Order. 
Their numerous foundations are the major funders of elite policy-making groups such as the Council on Foreign Relations, the Bilderberg Group, and the Trilateral Commission. Do they see themselves as enlightened ones while pursuing self-beneficial plans only? It sure seems that way. Known officially as Liberty Enlightening the World, the 151-foot Statue of Liberty located in New York Harbor is one of the most highly recognized symbols in the world. The statue was a gift from France to the United States. It was funded, designed, and built by Freemasons. The Grand Lodge of New York performed a cornerstone laying ceremony on August 5, 1885. This statue is supposedly inspired by Libertas, the Roman goddess and personification of liberty. But when you study the symbolism and features, you might conclude that this is actually a different deity altogether. It could be Mithras, also known as the guardian of the cattle. It could be Helios, though my research shows that Helios could very well be a repackaging of Mithras. Some interesting connections show that the statue could be the goddess Ishtar and the United States or New York City is Mystery Babylon from Revelation in the Bible. But my research also reveals that the Roman Libertas could be a repackaging of the Babylonian Ishtar. Either way, this Illuminati landmark is too colossal to pass up for this list. Pillars of Hercules Located at Jews Gate as a monument to the importance that the Straits of Gibraltar has had in the world and continues to have. The pillars appear as supporters of the coat of arms of Spain. It bears the motto plus ultra, Latin for further beyond, implying that the pillars were a gateway. This monument is very similar to the gateway design in Freemasonry, and if we look at the time zone of this monument, we will see that it is located at zero. This matters in the context of the 101 metaphor of the gateway, which we see not only at this monument, but throughout the entertainment world. In George Orwell's 1984, Room 101 is described as the worst thing in the world. So where does this gate actually lead us? Built by the Freemasons, this New York Cathedral is among the largest in the world and remains unfinished to this day. That didn't stop it from being featured on the front page of Masonic World in March of 1925. This cathedral is passed off as a Christian church, but it's simply a cover from the mystery religion. There's a pillar on the building where stonemasons have sculpted a chilling depiction of the destruction of New York City and its landmarks. On another pillar, the Brooklyn Bridge is crumbling with cars and buses falling into violent waters, with the Statue of Liberty, which seems to be sinking into the water as well. Beneath this disturbing scene is the New York Stock Exchange, with people trading goods around it. Here's the craziest thing. Saint John the Divine is credited for writing the Book of Revelation in the Bible, which describes in symbolic imagery the events of the apocalypse. Again, just like the Statue of Liberty, we have a connection of New York to Babylon the Great, the city that gets completely destroyed by the wrath of God in the Book of Revelation. This place is littered with many other symbolic works, the largest airport in the United States and one of the most bizarre airports in the world, the Denver International Airport. Denver New World Airport was commissioned in 1989 at a cost of $1.7 billion. The airport was finished in 1995, two years late, at a cost of $4.8 billion, roughly $3.1 billion over budget. A marker stone in the terminal reads that the airport was funded by the New World Airport Commission but there exists no such commission. Many people believe that an underground city lies beneath the Denver airport. Built by the New World Order to house the elites in case of an economic collapse or any other disaster. Driving into the airport, you are greeted by a demonic horse with glowing red eyes. When you get into the building, you are greeted by demons in suitcases and bone-chilling murals that depict an apocalyptic event followed by the rebirth of a new world. As a Colorado resident, I frequently look into this Illuminati landmark. 
All right, <clears throat> so there's a term uh, Zeus Revelations come up with, the Ill Illusionati. <laughs> it's a great term. So here you see Pope Francis, the first Jesuit pope in 600 years, and his partner, I forget his name, he's uh, not the uh, Superior General Black Pope now. But uh, there's a lot of stories going around that Pope Francis is the Black Pope now. Generally, the Black Pope is a few degrees higher than the White Pope that you see, um, but you can see the black and white here, and that's what <clears throat> we want to get into. So the secret societies are divided into two factions known as the Illuminati and the Occult. The Illuminati are the false light pyramid and they run the Republican Party, while the Occult are the false dark pyramid that runs the Democratic Party. These two pyramids are merged together to form a hexagram. A hexagram is, a, is two pyramids converged. You'll see that on the flag of Israel. An upside down pyramid and a right side up pyramid. Blue is used for Democrats to represent. This is me talking. Blue is used for Democrats to represent compassion and caring for all of and the all, and the luminary Venus. Red for Republican is Mars the warrior, competition, capitalism, and self enrichment. This is why you get to choose only between your daddy the red or mommy the blue to who will be your nanny. We live in a nanny state, folks, and that's why they use blue and red. They call their artificial duality Zion. Illuminati are more connected with Lucifer, while the occult are more connected with Satan. The color white is connected with the Illuminati, and the color black is connected with the occult. Freemasons use black and white checkerboard pattern as a symbol for their belief systems. The black and white, the black and white checkerboard is also connected with the Gulf, Gulf, and Gibeline factions in the royal and noble families. Excuse the pronunciation, mispronunciation. Many royal palaces use checkerboard floors, and some black nobility use the checkerboard on their coat of arms. The Pope wears a white robe and the Jesuit general wears a black robe, and they are the top priests of the Roman Catholic Church. And here I believe you see a wedding here and in the British royalty, and they got the black and white floors here. It's right there, folks. I call those who are initiated into both factions the Illus Illusionati. They manip manipulate both sides and use illusions to make it seem as if they are in control. Full initiates often choose a side as a cover while they meddle in both sides. Most of their power is based on illusions and trickery. They want to be perceived as if they are in full control and all-powerful, but they are not. They carry out most of their lawlessness like, persecu like their persecutions covertly because they are terrified of being exposed. They fear exposure because they are not really in control, and if people realize this, it will bring about an end. This is why we have to speak out at all costs, folks. The play on ignorance and use distractions to keep attention off, them, off themselves. This is, this is the bread and circuses from the old Roman days, sports and fed and happy and keep the TV going and all the social media devices and then get away with anything. They are criminals and their weakness is covert. The word government means control the mind. Govern means to rule, meant is for mental. They use corporate institutions to claim ownership over the land and then attempt to dictate thoughts and public opinion into society through media and education. These people are all criminals. They are not to be taken lightly. Their motive is world dominance and full-scale control. If they could, they would find a way to control every thought that a person has. They are a threat to humanity and must be dealt with. The best way to deal with them is to take back the system and install freedom. Good luck with that. Freemasonic Luciferian Persecutors Luciferianism is Satanism masked in the false light of superficiality and religion. Freemasons are known for worshiping Lucifer, and most Freemasons are self-identified Christians. Luciferians dress in nice clothes, they speak proper, they drive really nice cars, and then they condemn others for their superficial reasons. They covertly condemn the poor and sick as sinners and claim they are being punished by God. Freemasons are involved in the covert persecution against those who oppose their ways and control. Freemasons are also created, also created other types of secret societies which they use to do their dirty work. Freemasons get paid to gang stalk and persecute people all over the United States. This is touchless torture, um, as this clip above. I hope you click on it and you look at the touchless torture videos I did uh, on what they're capable of and what they're doing to innocent people. They cyberstalk their victims. They gang stalk and mentally tor tor terrorize their victims wirelessly. They are involved with using electronic weapons on people. Electromagnetic pulse weapons do exist, and they're even sold online. Um, their persecution often leads to deaths, mental breakdowns, hospitalization, and prison for the victims. Many Freemasons and members of secret societies are involved in computer hacking as well. 
The top Luciferian Freemasons inside the United States is a man by the name of Stephen James Deshawn, and his last known residence is in Linwood, Michigan. These secret societies are being funded by the Vatican and royal families through the offshore accounts, PayPal, and private Swiss banking. I could not find anything on Stephen James Deshawn, so you researchers out there, let's see if you can find anything and shoot it to me or put it in the comments. Uh, Freemasons are builders. The word Mason means builder. They build mind control programs in society. They build lies and false teachings and oppose them in society. They get paid to lie and manipulate people. They are funded and directed by the black nobility and royal bloodlines. They are paid actors that hijack society and orchestrate theater in the media and politics. They create orchestrated attempts as an attempt to draw people in. They hijack real movements and then subvert them. The alternative media is run by Freemasons who pretend to be opposed to the New World Order while all they do is subvert and corrupt the movements against corruption. Most of the Founding Fathers in America were Freemasons and Crown Agents that hijacked the revolution against the British Crown. They then turned the Virginia Company into the United States. The Freemasonic motto is, quote, Ordo Ab Caio, or Order Out of Chaos. This is on the dollar bill on the back. They cause chaos and then, no, I'm sorry, this isn't on the dollar bill, I was thinking of something else. They then turn the Virginia Company into the United States. The Freemasonic motto is Orbo Ab Chao, or Order Out of Chaos. They cause chaos and they use the conflict to install their order as a form of problem, reaction, solution. 9-11 is a great example of that. The Scottish Rite Freemasons and Prince Hall Freemasons have staged numerous racial crimes involving white cops and black men to incite racial division. This is the hashtag Black, Li black Lives Matter I think he's referring to. My comment, Prince Hall is a black Freemason cult, and you can see a picture here of Shaq O'Neal with his Freemason brothers. The Freemasons are criminals involved with a multitude of crimes, including terrorism, persecution, treason, spreading dangerous lies, human trafficking, and the trafficking of human blood. Freemasons is a dangerous organized crime syndicate. Uh, I'll list in the show notes here all the different um, Freemason secret societies that uh, few of you have ever heard of. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. So here we are in the Grand Lodge of Scottish Rite of Freemasonry here in Washington, D.C. We are inside the building right now. We're going to take a little bit of a tour, check out some of the scenery in here. This is Albert Pike. He was our Grand Commander from 1859 till 1891 when he died in office. Uh, the reason why he's so significant is because he rewrote the rituals of masonry and he rewrote the code book, Morals and Dogma. We have his body downstairs. Was there another like kind of Grand Commander before Albert Pike? Yeah, there were several Grand Commanders before him, but he's the most prominent. Uh, he died at 82 years old, and so we asked every Grand Commander to step down on their 81. rather blown away by the uh, really the occult significance of the architecture inside the building um, we were shown one of the main 
ritual rooms where they conduct their rituals where only members of the 33rd degree are allowed in there and the tour guide himself didn't seem to know a whole lot about the actual symbols and the meaning behind uh, some of the symbolism. So we call this room our temple room. Uh, it's not actually designed to look like a Christian temple. You'll um, notice the dome above us. It weighs 330 tons and there's only steel found at the base of it. The reason why there's a hole or an oculus is because Masons believe anything that is perfect must be created by God. There are 33 chairs in this room. There are 33 degrees in Scottish Rite Masonry, uh, 33 states in the southern jurisdiction, so that's why you'll see the number 33. All the wood in this room is from Russia. It's Russian walnut. The altar in the middle of the room is black marble quarried from Lake Champlain in New York. And the Hebrew writing in the middle says, God said, let there be light, and there was light. So there's three with one missing, it looks like. Is this the I don't know exactly. north, south, west, and the east is missing, or? No, um, that would be the east. That would be the east? Because that's north. Right. right. Um, I don't know why that is missing, actually. I asked him why there were only three lights at the altar, and uh, he said he wasn't too sure why, but there are three because one represents the east, one represents the west, one represents the south, but in masonry, the north is the place of darkness. And of course, uh, according to the Bible, the Bible tells us that the north is where God resides. Masonic Holy Bible. When was this built? The building? Uh, in 1911. It was started and it was finished in 1915. Oh, okay. uh, this was the architect's first major building. He went on to do the National Archives, National Gallery of Art, and the Jefferson Memorial. The snakes represent chaos, and the further up you go in the windows, the more light they let in, symbolizing enlightenment. So it's supposed to mean when you join masonry, you join at a time of chaos in your life, and the further up you go in degrees, the more enlightened you become. So, in the beginning, you just have to be open to the concept of there being a god. Uh, but as you work your way up the ranks and you gain enlightenment, he showed us windows in there that get brighter and brighter as you go up. And I found that very interesting. The windows were also surrounded by serpents. I asked him, what is the symbolism of the serpent? He said, that's all about order out of chaos. The, the serpents represent chaos. And that is the motto of Freemasonry, really, is order out of chaos. This is precisely how they can gain their control. The pillars are 30 tons of Windsor granite, uh, quarried from uh, uh, Indiana, and the velvet is 400 pounds of Italian velvet. sessions to make sure people didn't listen in. Of course we have the sword downstairs and it's not sharp. I don't think he had to hit anyone with it, but you never know. And Know Thyself is a quote from Pythagoras. Uh, it's a quote that Masons take to heart. sword right here. This is the, the sword the man held uh, that I was telling you about upstairs. As you can see, it's not sharp. This is the Grand Camp Commander's Scepter. It's what he would carry in to start council sessions. And this case will only be opened in October of this year for a council session. Uh, council sessions every other year in October. This is where the 33 inspector generals would meet. There are 33 states in the southern jurisdiction, and we are the headquarters of the southern jurisdiction of Scottish Rite Masonry. 
Uh, they would meet in here at night. They would discuss legislative and money issues in here. Upstairs was mainly used for rituals. The ceiling actually used to be open. It used to be an open ceiling, but they closed that off because the meetings in here were held at night. There was no point having an open ceiling. And the reason why there's a Bible, a Quran, and a Torah on the altar here is because you don't have to believe in uh, Jesus Christ. You can be uh, any, one, uh, any religion just so long as you believe in God and be a Mason. These are just the holy books our leaders pray to. The reason why they have the Quran and the Bible and the Pentateuch uh, is because, uh, as he said in his own words, you don't have to believe in Jesus Christ. You just have to believe in the idea that there is a God. And that is because Freemasonry is very much an ecumenical movement. It brings together all kinds of religions because you have to be open to the concept of there being a God. They refer to the God as the grand architect of the universe. That way it can encompass everyone on earth and and there can be members of the brotherhood from the muslim world members of the brotherhood from the christian world all over the world bringing them all together so if you donate one million dollars or more you get your name on a plaque here and you get a picture downstairs we do have some plaques that open here so if you all have a million dollars just lying around we accept checks <laughs> cash credit cards the bush family and the studebaker family are up there uh, although neither George Bush Sr. nor Jr. was a Mason. The light well in the back there was put in in 1993. There are 33 beams of light, and Fiat Lux uh, is Latin for let there be light, and Ordo Ab Chao is order from chaos. What is the significance of the like or okay. It's like a Masonic motto almost. So when you join Masonry, you're, they say your life is in chaos. Like you're not completely, you're not orderly. Mm -hmm. But the further up you go in Masonry, the more order you gain, the more enlightenment you gain. 14 US presidents were Masons, but the last one was Ford. Bill Clinton was a Malay, which is a junior Mason. <laughs> never became a full mason. I remember reading online that the, this building is based off of a, like a Roman uh, it, design. It's the Mausoleum of Halicarnassus. Mm -hmm. uh, it's one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Okay. It's, um, it's the tomb of the emperor, the king Halicarnassus. And on either side of our pillars of charity are our crypts. So Mr. Pike is buried six feet behind here, and Mr. Cowles is buried six feet behind there. Uh, Mr. Pike was moved here in 1944. We were fighting World War II at the time, so there was no mayor of Washington, D.C. So we had to ask the U.S. Congress to, if we could move his body across state lines. So it took an act of Congress to bring Mr. Pike here. Mr. Cowles lived in this building. He was our grand commander in the first half of the century. Uh, he lived in this building, he died in this building, and he wanted to be buried here. Uh, I've been told that these two men roam the halls as ghosts. I have never, I've not seen that, but if you do see them, let me know. Albert Pike is a main component of this building. We were shown statues of Pike. We were shown where his body is entombed inside of here. And, uh, and, and Albert Pike is also the one who wrote Morals and Dogma. And he very openly talks about who the true God of Freemasonry is. And in Morals and Dogma, he mentions that when you look to the light, uh, as they told us over and over again, masonry is about finding the light, and Albert Pike, which he clearly is highly revered, tells us in his book, Morals and Dogma, that the light bearer is Lucifer. So this room houses our Albert Pike collection. Not only was Albert Pike our Grand Commander from 1859 until 1891 when he died in office, he was also a well-known teacher, lawyer, explorer, and Confederate general. He fought for the South during the Civil War because he thought the South would treat the Native Americans better. He was born in Massachusetts, but he, uh, he did not fight for the North. All the books you see in this room are from his personal library, and he wrote about half of them.
So this room is our uh, banquet hall. This room holds 400 people, and we mostly rent it out for charity events, speakers, dinners, that sort of thing. But there is no alcohol allowed in this building, so no casino events or weddings are held here. Most of these lodges do not allow alcohol, except for Shriners lodges, which is Shriners is another set. These two paintings here are Masonic paintings, uh, painted by brother John Melius in the 70s. This painting is of George Washington laying the cornerstone to our capital. This is significant because he's wearing his full Masonic ritual regalia. He's got his square and compass, he's got his apron, he's got his gavel. And the three men to the right of him here are holding corn, oil, and wine, which are Old Testament gifts of prosperity. And they were leaders of lodges from around here. Now that cornerstone has been lost to history. People have tried looking for it and they cannot find it. They bury cornerstones under the ground. People have told me that that cornerstone has some Masonic writing on it. Whether that's some lost legend or a mystery on it, I don't know, but we cannot find it. This painting is of George Washington taking the oath of office as our first president. This is in New York because New York was the capital at the time. And the reason why this painting is so significant is because the man in blue holding the Bible is a Mason, and he's holding a Masonic Bible. That is the Bible that has been used by basically every president since George Washington. Although Barack Obama did not use that Bible, he used Abraham Lincoln's personal Bible. Uh, that Bible has still been used by basically every president. What's the difference between a Masonic Bible versus a... Uh, Masonic Bible has Masonic inscriptions in it. It's still a King James Bible. It just has Masonic inscriptions and they use it for rituals. So this hallway contains paintings of each degree's regalia. So these plaques here say which degree you are. So the 22nd degree is the Knight Royal Axe, Prince of Libanus. And this uh, text here is the lesson that you learned at that degree. You all can feel free to take a look at each one of the degrees. Take your time. shelters, that sort of thing. Masons do a lot. It's just not something people know about. Is the philanthropy uh, public or do you mean they don't know? It, it's it public. Means? It's just people don't pay attention to it or people have certain assumed things about masonry like they think it's a cult or something like that. They choose to ignore this sort of thing. room in here uh, contains international books, so minutes or notes from lodges around the world, they get sent to us and we categorize them. Other famous Masons include Gene Autry, Audie Murphy, Douglas MacArthur, Brad Paisley, Arnold Palmer, uh, J. Edgar Hoover. There have been many famous people that have been Masons. We call this room our Americanism, Americanism Museum. It's dedicated to famous Americans who have been Masons. Some highlights include a portrait of George Washington that you see there. We have the 33rd copy. We also have a replica flag of the Masonic flag that was put on the moon. A Masonic flag was put on the moon? Yep. Buzz Aldrin was a Mason. He put a Masonic flag on the moon. So he left more than just like it? Yeah, a, lo a larger version of it. They brought 14 flags to the moon and only took a couple back. I've only ever seen pictures of the American flag. Stuff you don't know. Yeah.
I didn't know the cat in the hat was a Freemason. Was Dr. Seuss a Mason? No, he was not. <laughs> this is just for kids. Oh, okay. into the library of uh, Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, where it's probably one of the largest collection of Freemasonic uh, books inside. Um, so, yeah, I don't know what else to say. I'm, I'm rather blown away, and uh, it's, it was, it was quite, the, quite the experience. I could almost feel the creepy, evil energy coming off of this place just from being inside. Yeah, Mason Bible. Totally demonic. Well, they, for Masonic use. So they've got alternate definitions of words. But what really shocked me the first time I picked this up, Sun God, Ra, Amen, the Father of God, the Creator, published in the Freemason Bible. Which, as near as I can tell, it's uh, a King James uh, book. People like Jordan Maxwell and and the woman who made Ring of Power, they try and mix up language and they say, oh well, when you say Amen at the end of a prayer, you're really this is who you're saying your prayer to, Amen Ra. Well, that's a lie. Uh, no, Amen is Hebrew for so be it or it is so. Oh, so be it, or something I think like it's that. so be it. It's Hebrew. Talk to anyone who's Hebrew and say, "How do you? What does Amen mean?" And they'll say, "Well, it is so." And that's the truth. That's why we say Amen at the end of a prayer because it's Hebrew for "so be it." Or, I think it's so be it. But these liars are trying to convince everyone that you're praying to Amen Ra, the Sun God. That's the mystery religions. They mix in all these lies and pagan sun worshipping trying to corrupt and pervert everything. So even the Christian halo comes from these. Yeah, I know, yeah. The halo never appeared. Never in the Bible says that until anything about anything like that. that. Until uh, the fourth set, yeah. And so we've got all this Babylonian crap mixed in here. And these are, there's an obelisk. Well, that's, uh, that was Osiris's penis. That's, that's, uh, phallic worship. Yeah. Yeah, and the Washington Monument, it's an Egyptian obelisk. There's one at the middle of St. Peter's Square in the Vatican. There's another one in the middle of 
the city of London, these Egyptian obelisks, what are they doing all over the planet? The Oval Office is actually a female genital. Yeah. And the steeple is actually going penetrating it. Well, yeah, from a certain angle. It's a steeple penetrating the uh, Oval Office, which is a female. You just need to watch Christian J. Pinto. are about the history and blah, blah, blah. But then you flip to the back, and there's all this Egyptian Babylonian account of the building of the walls and temples of Babylon. I think it's interesting that Saddam Hussein actually believed that he was Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah. <laughs> he thought he was a reincarnation of Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah. There's even a statue in Iraq that says that. See how he's bigger than all the others? Because he's the god, and they're the people who are worshipping the giant Nephilim gods from back in the day. These are given to initiated when they're when they're reborn. Okay. Now this belonged to Brother Edward Black, it was initiated November 10th, 36. He passed and then was raised. And when you're raised, you're reborn. That was uh, 36. This guy was initiated. And then these are all the large numbers of visiting brethren and friends. Lodge number 231, 669, and the names. The names of the lodges and the numbers of the lodges. And this is the guy who raised up, fellow candidates. I guess that's witnesses, I don't know. But these are supposed to be returned upon death. And I guess what happened was that this guy passed away and whoever was handling his estate just dropped off a bunch of books at the used bookstore, not realizing that this was contained within and the significance of it. So I'm not supposed to have this, but the person at the used bookstore knew it would be appreciated and set it aside. And it's got the compass and square right on the front. It's blue. It's got a blue cover and it's got the compass and square right on the front. It says Freemasonic Mas Bible. That's what it says. This is copyrighted 1928. And it opens up with the Holy Bible and Freemasonry and explains. They try and justify or, or convince the unsuspecting Mason that uh, See, the first, I think the first degree, uh, when you're doing the the ceremony, you're asked, uh, what do you seek? Light. And then the second degree, it's what do you seek? More light. And then the third degree, what do you seek? Uh, further light. And they rise up through the, the degrees. Now, Stan Monteith does a great uh, presentation called The Hidden Secret. And, and the hidden secret, which is revealed at the 33rd degree, is that the light you've been seeking all of this time is the light of the light bearer, Lucifer. The Ralph Rep Epperson presentation, the second witness to the apocalypse, goes into all this in great detail with the quotes directly from Manly Pete Paul and Albert Pike. It explains how uh, all Masons swear an oath to destroy Christianity at all costs, regardless of whether you have to murder, lie, steal, doesn't matter, everything is justified. Here, we get into page 7, and they're explaining how the Bible became a great light. See, they use this term, light, light, great light, all the way through, and, and the hidden secret, which is not revealed until the 33rd degree is what the light really is. Yeah. So we get into the, the story of the English Bible, and there's all this stuff prefacing the actual beginning of the Bible. King Solomon's temple. It's all very startling. I'm trying to be careful because it's a Masonic Bible. Okay. okay, the construction of the temple, they're getting into Solomon's temple. Masonic ritual. Okay, we're on page 31. And then we get 
page 33. The Holy Bible starts off page 33. Could that be a coincidence? What's the significance of 33? The Holy Bible starts on the 33rd page of the Masonic Bible. Pretty demonic, isn't it? And I haven't gone through it in great detail. It appears to be a King James Version. But then you flip to the back and there's all this Egyptian Babylonian symbols and how it relates to the content of the book. And seals, the, uh, hieroglyphs that are taken off seals. And I'm looking at this and I'm going, this Babylonian shit has nothing to do with this book? This is like, ah! <laughs> I put it down and went, oh, this is bad. <laughs> At first glance, the Manitoba legislature is like other Canadian provincial parliaments, based on Gothic designs of the early 20th century. But look closely. See the detail. There's something extraordinary here. Just ask local historian Frank Alba. I was driving down this familiar street and out of the corner of my eye I spotted these two Egyptian sphinxes and I thought, you know, what on earth is the embodiment of the sun god doing in this frozen, bald prairie? For 11 years now, Alba's been studying this building. He discovered that the architect based the design on an ancient temple in Jerusalem and it combined Greek and Roman myth, religion, numerology and the precepts of a secret society that's still around today. If you're really in the greatest temple ever constructed by the Freemasons, King Solomon's temple, destroyed 2,600 years ago, what you'd expect to find in the center is a blazing star, a blazing black star in the center. Conspiracy theories about such things abound. Witness the success of the Da Vinci Code or internet sites that speculate that Washington DC streets are laid out to a secret plan. Alba yeah, insists his work is different. Here the um, fact is much more engaging than the, a fictional conspiratorial uh, trail. This is a product of the early 20th century and the mind of a genius who happened to be an architect and obsessed with the ancient mystical world. More than 11,000 people have taken this tour, whether it's the abiding appeal of strange historical secrets or a genuine interest in architecture and design, people can't get enough of it. There's mysteries out there that just uh, we don't know about. I'm just, uh, yeah, it it's, it's just makes you think like crazy. You either know or you don't know, and I know that most, well, everything you said is fact. I want to believe it. I, if it would be a priest, I will go in his, uh, in his sept. Or in his, uh, it's fantastic. Esoteric and occult symbolism, references to Christianity, Jewish mysticism and Freemasonry, and strange acoustics in a room that's supposed to represent a sacrificial altar. The Manitoba legislature has it all. Daniel Lack, Al Jazeera, Winnipeg.